I'm Dr. Susan Eyrick, and welcome to this conservation conversation. These conversations are designed to contemplate our collective journey together and how best we can find and then maintain our individual paths. The ultimate goal is action arising from a shift in perception that all life is sacred and creating a community of practice that grows and supports each other through our actions. We're delighted you're here. So welcome everybody. I read an interesting article recently um, asking, where is our loyalty? So when we say, and this is for every single one of us, we're all lost in the same kind of frame of reference in different degrees. And we need to help each other get out of that frame of reference. So the question is, how can we stop climate change? We often then say, well, how can we stop climate change without really changing too much about how we live on the planet? That's really what often we mean. It takes a lot of deep thought to think about how we're gonna fundamentally change things. And the truth is we can't, according to a really interesting article by Beth Robeson, she says the truth is we can't change, um, stop climate change without substantially changing how we live on the planet. We can't. So the interesting question she raises is, where is my loyalty? If the answer to the question she writes is anything other than with nature, we can't expect life on this planet to go on much longer. She says, it's like asking how can we save the salmon and the orcas without removing dams, stopping industrial logging that impacts the rivers, stopping industrial agriculture that poisons the rivers, stopping industrial fishing that overfishes, stopping industrial plastics, we can't. So the right question to ask is, where's my loyalty? And if it's anything other than with nature, we're in trouble. She said, we can't live without functioning ecosystems. And when we place our loyalty with nature, however, everything else falls into place. When we place our loyalty with nature, then everything we need to do to stop climate change, to save the orcas, to save the salmon, to save the forest becomes crystal clear. Stopping climate change then really becomes easy because we see what it is that we need to do. So that's the overall beginning discussion. Question for all of us is, it's so difficult for us to, particularly given the pressures of the culture and the media and everything, it's so difficult for us to actually step out of how we're living because everything around us is supporting it and begin to look at what do we buy? What do we eat? What do we support? Um, what kind of cultures do we support? There's an interesting article talking about the car culture, that the idea of getting electrical cars is still within the same frame of reference, which is what I meant at the beginning when I say we're all kind of lost in it. We're still using cars and we're still using energy. The right question is, do we need cars? And why do we need all that energy? Um, how, and I think all of us, we're all trying to um, de-program ourselves and start to think more clearly, but it's difficult. It's very difficult. Almost all of us, feel it's fine to buy a piece of land, which is an interesting concept to begin with, and then use the land to buy a house on, put, to put a house on, and set up all the electrical and other systems that we need without ever asking the land or even considering it. And that comes from an, something that was done a long time ago with the Industrial Revolution, 
um, when we began taking more from nature than we give back to get capital, and that nature is uh, begins to become property. It's our right to do what we want. It's my land. I can do what I want. It's my. I can go to the store. It's my money. We can do what we want. It's such a fundamental thing we have to begin to change because all the smaller things we do, while they might be useful, are not going to make fundamental change. Another interesting article talked about um, these references I can give you, uh, the plastic bag distraction. So, okay, so we want to ban single-use plastic bags. But what difference does that make if we're still producing 800 thousand pounds or so of plastic a year and the whole process is poisoning the planet. Why do we need plastic at all? I think I've mentioned once before, okay, we ban single plastic use things, uh, uh, bags, and it becomes a thing and, and they talk about it in the media and we feel good about it and there's certainly nothing wrong with it. But meanwhile, they're building huge factories to make more plastic with more poisons. Um, and it's very difficult for us to begin to think clearly. Uh, basically, all plastic that's ever been made doesn't get destroyed. It stays on the planet forever. Why do we even need it? As, the, as a, this particular author, Joey Monkarts, writes, people lived for two million years without plastic. We don't actually need it. The whole idea that we actually have to pay, get money in order to pay to live on the planet is a whole new idea. So I'm bringing these things up because we, we need a radical rethinking. And radical is a touchy word because it has all these other implications to it. But really, um, we need radical thinking at this time. And we can't have timid thinking at this time. I'm always reluctant to do this because we hear so much negativity and so much bad news all the time. I prefer to keep these conversations in a way of... Um, uh, positive and uplifting. But actually, in a way, this is because if we actually start to really truly come to grips with what's happening and what we needs to be done, we can get to work on it. And that's truly positive and energizing and supporting of one another. Um, I think on that note, I will stop and hear what cheerful things you guys have to say. Hey, well, I'm a uh... First time on the call and um, really something moved me to be on this call, rather new to Earth Fire. And uh, I'll, I'll just add something, appreciate the space for the conversation. And uh, when you said about industrialization, when, when that started up, that, that's all of a sudden I've been thinking about that and everything that happened from that point forward and looking at, at all of the issues we're having on our planet with climate and all of a sudden, here's where I am. I'm at the point of being upended. I feel like I grew up a certain way. Oh, you buy this, you get a house, you do this, that, and the other. And all of a sudden, I'm looking around thinking, what? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I had a lot of uh, pain, a couple of diseases. It's not terminal, but degenerative, which has led me to Reiki, energy healing, animal communication, uh, it's like I have a hard time even squashing fruit flies anymore. So I've done a big turnaround. And, and my point here is um, I, I moved to this conversation. Um, the first thing that, that comes to me at this point is um, education. Uh, there has to be education. I, I think being aware is half the battle. So look, I've not been on these calls, but I'm just moved to say, to say that because it may be considered radical to, to have education. I think there needs to be a way without judgment, uh, with educating. Like I thought, what impacts climate change? And I, I thought I'm not going to bring that up. That's a broad topic, but I'm bringing it up. What impacts climate change? And how can we, how can I be educated? How can I put that out there? How can I have this question and education resonate within myself, starting with my morning animal Reiki meditation sessions? So few thoughts to share. Thanks for the space. 
For those of you who are new here, I usually try to just be quiet and give everyone the time and space they need to speak. Silence is fine. Um, if I have a passionate thought, I will. But meanwhile, this really is a conversation among all of us. Hi, Susan. Hi, Joanna. Um, I think this is a really brilliant question that you've asked, really. I mean, where does your loyalties lie? And certainly we can do the small things. And sometimes they don't seem really small. <laughs> um, but how is it that we can uh, do things on a, can we impact any kind of broader thing? And I, I was thinking about it um, simply, you know, I joined a thing in my neighborhood, maybe other people are doing that too, called Buy Nothing. And so it's an online thing where you barter, really. And um, if you have something that you don't need, you post it up there and somebody who needs it, um, instead of taking it to Goodwill where people have to buy it, um, <clears throat> then you can just trade things. And so that uh, if you need something, it's not necessarily new. We're re reusing things that other people have maybe only used once or twice, and then they don't need it anymore. And, and I've gone to other kinds of things like um, just small little things like how I make my coffee, right? <laughs> and, and doing it in a way that uses less electricity or, um, but I was thinking about, you know, educating people when going back to something that Diane said. Um, I think, you know, educating young women uh, is really going to be crucial. And I know that I support in, um, several young women in Africa um, to go to nursing school. And I think those are, are really important things that we have to do. The other thing we have to do is we have to really include this in education. And I have a really good friend who is the director of the uh, Family Nurse Practitioner Program at a big, large university. And they've just really added climate change, climate crisis, um, talking about those types of things actually in their nursing programs so that as it moves more towards community health then you've got to be able to talk about the environment you can't just talk about the health of a human being so I think there there are some things that are that are coming forward but obviously they're not going to be in our lifetime but if we can get some of those things started at this point in time I think we have a bigger impact than just in our own personal environment so I, I really want to uh, just encourage people. It doesn't cost sometimes to uh, help pay and support somebody to educate them in a, in a third world country or even in our own. So I just want to throw that out there. I wanted to say one other thing. I'm from Oregon. <laughs> you said to tell us where we're from. And oftentimes we forget that. Thank um, you. Yes. Yeah. So I live in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Las Vegas, Nevada. You're right. I forgot Thank that. You. <laughs> Katie, I am Katie Bouton and I live in Laramie, Wyoming right now. And I'm from upstate New York near the Cooperstown area. And um, it has been a culture shock in a way to move to Wyoming where fossil fuel is king. And uh, conversations are difficult. Education is difficult. We're trying. Um, I'm part of a climate change um, activist group here, but it's slow going. Um, interestingly, what we have found, speaking of education, is we are finding that kids are getting involved and we are getting at the rallies, we're getting um, high school and college kids and they're, they're, they're coming out in droves, which is just so gratifying because even though we were very active in upstate New York, um, you know, we were the first community to ban fracking, you know, I mean, the environment is big in, in New York, but here, you know, fossil fuel drives um, the economy. And uh, yesterday was the governor's speech and he was reconfirming his commitment to fossil fuels. So, but we have the young ones here and the young ones are becoming involved and it's very heartening. So education is the key. Getting the kids out there is a huge key. Um, let's keep it going. So Wyoming is challenging though. <laughs> yeah. My only comment, Katie, thank you. Weren't you the one who was having trouble last time getting on? Yes. 
and you can only chat. Oh, I'm yep. glad. Yes. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. The only comment I would make is I think it's um, misleading for us to talk about the environment. As soon as we say the environment is separate from us, and then we make decisions. We're trying to fix it, but it's still the environment. It's not the very air that's coming into it, this moment that I breathe into my very blood cells and into my brain and part of me at this very moment. We're so much a part of it. If we talk about the environment, uh, we're starting to, to make the fundamental distinction that gets us into trouble. Right. So we have to work on the language. And we talked about that before, Joanna. I've not come up with any great solution other than using the word life <laughs> instead of nature or, or the earth. No, it's our earth. And it's, it's our brothers and sisters and, and everything around us. That's the fundamental switch we haven't made. And though I think everyone on this call feels that, Katie, um, we still use the old language. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a bit problematic. Mm -hmm. I'm Cindy Edstrom. I'm from near Kalispell, Montana. Hi. And, uh, hi. Um, wanted to, I love the question of where do our loyalties lie and you know it's immediate my immediate answer of course was is with with nature or whatever language it is that we use that but um, but it's like although that but we, I know that and we probably all know that those of us that are here um, you know, the continued, I'm continually distracted by human culture um, and by, you know, daily responsibilities and, yeah. and, and all of those sorts of things. It becomes very difficult um, to, to remain in a space where, we, where, where I remember that I'm, I am part of nature and yet I own land. And I, own, and I own land where I have to drive to get to a place to get supplies. And then there are those bigger questions. It's like, well, should anybody be living here in this part of the country? Um, or, you know, there, there's totally different, uh, different ways of, of thinking, of trying to get out of, out of the, um, all of the traps that we're in, try to repair a house and what's available, what can one find to, make repairs or, um, you know, it, anyway, it's, it is a very, but I guess the first step is starting to ask all those questions. It's like, well, why is this what's available? What other options are there? Um, and then try to at least imagine what they are, even if the choice doesn't exist at this moment. So I can certainly accept the, um, the, I wanted to also mention the, we did we did go the electric car route, um, and what we found is that what I'm finding is that it uses and we have solar energy, um, but what I find is it uses so much of that energy budget to keep the car charged that uh, it's it's really it, I was really surprised. I thought here we're doing this you know positive thing by switching out of, of fossil fuel. Um, and generating our, it's hard, and we live in a cloudy winter, so it's a little hard. So it's, it's very, very interesting, but I think the whole question of bringing it back of like, I haven't thought about loyalty really um, in that way, because loyalty is often a trap. You know, if you're loyalty, loyal to your leader, regardless of whether your leader is good or bad, or you're loyal to your sports team, or you're loyal to your employer, or any of these things. Um, so it's, it's asking, that question is about a different type of, of, it's about a heart loyalty or a soul loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. I loved your comment about questions, um, imagining alternatives, even if the choices aren't available yet. That's where we need to be new thinking, not thinking electric cars are still within the same framework. Why do we have to set up a society where we need cars at all? There are all kinds of other interesting options that are much more communal too. I never mind. <laughs> um, right. 
So I really like what you are, what you, what you said about that. And the other comment I would say is what a beautiful thing you said about heart and soul, because loyalty has another side of it. You're going to be loyal to your family. You're going to be loyal to your animals. You're going to be loyal to the trees on your land. Is it? whole other aspect to it but loyalty can have these different levels as in okay i'm loyal to my family and no matter what i'm going to do what's needed for them yes but in the process you might be doing stuff that sets up a system that ultimately is not going to let them survive in a much larger picture so the idea of loyalty can't be the simple narrow very attractive, very entrancing, strictly biological version of loyalty. It must be more a spiritual version in the sense of um, deeply connecting to all life and considering that. And then we will be taking care of our families, but we're not going to be taking care of them with a limited sense of loyalty, which is also what gets the world into trouble. And tribal loyalties don't work. Yeah, Susan, this is something I thought a lot about lately. And in some of my um, spiritual work and stuff, I, I think that, and I just want to say, because people sometimes blithely um, or mean, mean really well when they're sending healing somewhere in the universe or set, trying to send rain to Australia and, um, but one of the things that bothers me is, is that we don't seem to ask nature what it needs. We just make an assumption that we know what's best, best for it. And I think it's really important for us to sit back and really say, um, <clears throat> what is it you need from me from a, on a spiritual level? Or I can't just assume that I know what it takes what my tree needs to be healed. I've got to really sit and listen and look. And I have to look at it globally from multiple perspectives, particularly from the land's perspective or from, uh, I can't just make an assumption. And I think we make, we get in difficulty when we make big assumptions about what is needed where. And so I just want to throw that out about spiritual health when I talk about uh, thinking about the earth and where my loyalties lie, but I want to make sure that I'm not acting in the best interest of, but that I'm actually doing what that being needs. And uh, that requires not, a whole lot of different perspective. I would say, be careful about using the earth. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty big habit. Mm -hmm. yeah. But whatever, whatever I'm working with, right? If I'm going to work with the land, if I'm going to work with an animal, if I'm going to work with um, just uh, alternative reality. But I really want to make sure that I'm not just making an assumption of what's needed. It's got to be educated or it's, I've got to listen. Hi, Betty. It's so nice to see you. You're muted, so I can't hear you. What do you, do I, me, do I do something here? No, you're perfect. Now I can hear you. Okay. Uh, last couple times I've been snowed in. And I know that that is a, not a very, that's not a very good thing for me to say because you're living in tons <laughs> of snow. Yes. I mean, how do you do it? How does, how does that happen? I mean, we got 16 inches, no, seven inches this last time. And I had to get Tina down to the airport because she's going to Vermont where they have a lot of snow. Problem is that it got all slushy and I couldn't get my car out of the driveway. And then I had to wait till the next night came and I've been shoveling snow till my arms are ready to fall off. You know, I don't know about snow. I love it, but I can't live with it, seems like. Have to. <laughs> Have to. What do you do? 
you adapt to where you live. It's a little harder now with climate change, but you adapt to where you live. So you have snowshoes and you have skis and you have plows and Well, one of the things I don't have is I don't have four wheel drive. Yeah, I said it's and difficult. I guess I should have. It's difficult when, when this climate is changing, in, but still, essentially, Betty, um, it's not exactly on topic, but just as a thought, um, essentially, life has to adapt. Well, it and is life on does topic. adapt, and and oh. life and life does adapt. All life adapts. But change is difficult. Yeah. But it also in, in, engages our creativity, life's creativity. <laughs> Lisa and Janine, have, do you have anything? In, and Jan, I see a lovely picture of you. So this is Dawn. Um, I, I work at Earth Fire, but one of the questions or one of the things that um, some of your comments have co brought to my mind are the question of why. So when my daughter was small and there were things that she didn't understand, she would consistently ask why. Um, why, is, why do we have to feed the cow this way, mom? Why do we have to... Um, take the car to school? Why do we have to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Like, why was always there? Um, and the way I see it coming into this is when you're making the decisions of changes that you really need to make, um, asking yourself, why do I need to make this change? And if that why is, well, because I, I, I don't like driving really far, so I'm going to find a job that's close by. Then that's not really the, the kind of mindset we need to be in. You have to like stop and um, really refocus and rethink, no, no, what, what really is um, a good why? Like what is, what is the real why? Um, and it's almost like you'll have to ask yourself why a few times. So, um, to get down to, to the real point of of what that change is really going to make. So I'm going to stop using plastic bags. Well, why? Well, because they're just one use. Well, why is that important? Well, because it will affect the earth this way. Well, why is that important? Like, oh, because I really need to make this change because if we don't make these changes, then things aren't going to change. So that was just something that came to my mind was just really delving into the why and um, seeing what the root, the root why is. And the correlated, this is Cindy again, a corollary to that is asking um, why is about the obvious thing. Um, the things that you know that we're used to every day you know why why do we eat bananas when they don't grow anywhere near here um you know why is my county government set up this way you know why does my neighbor not to judge but um just various you know there's a lot of different whys we can ask you know why is it cold in this particular room um so it's a it's a really really good question that that I think can get us to to recognize assumptions assumptions and habits that otherwise we don't have any awareness of. That's what we really need to do. We need to open and open and open our minds to look at things and not get stuck within the frame of reference that we're raised in and that media shows us. Use our creative, brilliant, brilliant, creative, intelligent mind. There's a little thing here. Um, 
we talk about new renewable energy that in and of itself isn't so good. We still have factories, we still have toxic chemicals, we, the laws of thermodynamics still stay, and unintended consequences. And actually we still burn fossil fuels because that's the way to get the renewable energy. Um, so who decided that renewable energy is a solution? And more importantly, why do we even need all that energy? And then with renewable energy, the car culture remains too. What's interesting is that people are upset that plastic bags end up in the ocean and kill roughly 200,000 marine animals each year, but compare that to the car. Cars kill 1 million animals each day in the US alone. In Brazil, 1.3 million animals killed each day. It's um, more than 1 million humans are killed each year in car accidents. But we're talking about plastic bags. It's a much harder question to look at the entire system that was set up. And you can do this exercise with all kinds of, all kinds of things that we just sort of take for granted. I personally really firmly believe we have it in us to be creative enough to look at new ways of doing things. And if we can pull together the will, particularly women who tend to feel like we don't have enough, we're not powerful enough. If we can pull that together, we can make enormous positive changes, but we have to be able to think more clearly. And we get stuck in that. One of the reasons I love these conversations is there's a chance for real creativity to share it and support one another. Well, this is Diane again, and uh, I can see, uh, still from Las Vegas, so I can see there's going to be a change I can make tomorrow just with what uh, we share today and with the ideas uh, when I offer Reiki and Joanna I'm I'm sensitive to what you were saying about you know like offering or giving healing to a specific thing every morning I have an animal Reiki meditation session and I I am a conduit I, I'm just a, a hose and, and the energy is you know the Reiki is the healing and knows where to go so what I can do is just make a conscious awareness and just offer Reiki and invite and invite in uh, sentient beings. So, I mean, that's everybody. I just invite in and, and we're all together. And, and that's a start. So mm. just something I'm throwing out here. So thank you. And I'll be doing why ask why and why ask why I see why. And like you said, that, that's another exercise. You know, you can insert that with anything. So, so thank you, that, that's uh, exciting. May I make a comment? This is Jan. Hi, Jan. Hi. I was not gonna show myself because I just came from a hot yoga class and I just kind of feel like a, a total mess and I was really <laughs> listening in, uh, but I wanna offer something. Uh, that I spent the bit of the day with doctors, uh, and um, I love the asking of why. Uh, and I have a habit of asking uh, not so much why, and I'm going to do the why now, uh, but I, I ask, is that true uh, of myself or of, of other people in my head and sometimes out loud? Uh, and in, in a couple of sessions today, I, the is it true brought out the fact that at least half of the doctors were environmentalists, were uh, working for uh, uh, all kinds of causes that were uh, uh, close to my heart. I think they were close to your heart as well. They became all, all men, first of all. They became so vulnerable. Uh, they became so participatory. People are banging on the door to get them out of the room to because you know, I'm talking to them because they have to do other things. Uh, and, um, and I introduced myself as an environmentalist. Um, so, uh, and um, 
spoke up when I said I, I, I can't understand why that's true, why we have to do that. Uh, and, uh, um, and so it just opened up this safe space in a whole group of, you know, professionals uh, and they just talked uh, and it was great. Uh, and now everybody's we're exchanging, exchanging personal emails. This doesn't happen at Linux Hill. I'm in New York. Uh, and, um, and it was because I wasn't willing to just go along with everything and say, yeah, what, whatever they were talking about. And there's so many things being thrown away uh, and um, under, underutilized. And so this is vulnerability that, feel, that I feel uh, women have in, in a, a natural sense of being able to share, being more vulnerable. And now uh, today I just felt that from these, uh, these uh, doctors. Uh, and it was super nice. And when we have these conversations, it's like we're helping each other open a little more. Mm -hmm. Someone will ask a why that I didn't think to ask. Mm -hmm. my perspective, that's general human creativity growing and growing and growing. The lack of judgment was also so important. It's, it's always so important. So people don't feel um, <clears throat> like they're, they're saying things um, wrong, even if they're saying something from their heart. Uh, and. Uh, Although I, I totally appreciate the um, idea of the environment and the earth, you know, it's, it's us. Uh, and, um, and so gently the way you do it, and it's so beautiful, uh, offering that. And so people think before they speak again. Um, so that really feels good. Janine, Lisa. We'd love to hear. This is Katie. Hi, Katie. Again. Um, I just wanted to say from my point of view and from my heart, I thank you so much for this availability of this conversation because I think um, sometimes um, I look for people who I can connect with on this kind of a, a level. It's It's the whole topic is so overwhelming. And when we gather like this and we talk, we can kind of take it into smaller pieces so that it isn't quite as overwhelming. And I just thank you for the opportunity to be able to be a part of this. It's just, it's, uh, it's really a rare and wonderful thing that you've offered and I thank you. I thank you for coming and for doing the efforts that you're doing. A. There, did I open myself up? You did. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. This idea about having thing. I'm thinking, I'm trying to downsize. This idea of how do you get to put and where do you put things that you want to downsize it, not give it to goodwill. No. Give it to someone else who wants it. How do you find out who wants it? Whatever it, it is. Joanna, you had said something about that earlier. Yeah, there's in several communities, there is uh, an online group called Buy Nothing. And I think you can do that, uh, check it out for where you live. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I mean, it's just amazing. And, and a lot of my friends are doing that now. And um, just posting things, you know, like to say, well, I have a friend who just had a baby and 
um, she needed some things that she didn't have. <clears throat> and so she put it out there, does anybody have this? And then come to find out somebody had a, a sits bath and then and said, well, I don't need this anymore. And, and <clears throat> just post some things that you have up there. So check that out online and just see if you can find that somewhere in your community. <clears throat> What's what we're doing with that? Well, my community is very small. Like we have about 81 people that live up here in Mount Laguna. And, but there's other places that are nearby, Alpine mm -hmm. and El Cajon and San Diego. Yeah, but well, you might you find know, one of those. There. San Diego, I'm sure, the, probably well, has one. What's hmm. what? Say it again. How do we buy nothing? Buy nothing yes okay dot com nothing. Or? yes buy nothing dot com i'll look it up thank you yeah also depending on what kind of things you're getting rid of um like schools would know some people that need things um many communities at churches um will know of people who need things, what kinds of things. Um, and there's usually some sort of community, um, I don't know, group or something like that, um, that you're, um, oh, my brain stopped working, but that you're, the, the community, like the, the community leaders would know uh, what types of groups take things in and repurpose or, or give them to, to people who need them or want them without actually selling them. So those are some other options. Thank you. Thinking about something quite different, and I don't know if this makes sense or not, but this is an open conversation just to share ideas, no judgment. But someone talked about working the land before and we do that as a, just like the earth, the land. But would we ever talk about our dog as the dog? It's pretty rare that we talk about it as the dog. We talk about it as the being that it is. And I think loyalty in the best sense that we're trying to use, it has to do with a sense of connection and familiarity as well, which is what, one of the things that's so lacking um, with many of us with connection to, to nature or the rest of life. So those are areas we need to work on as well. Um, I just used the word the land earlier. Um, Cindy gave me the name of this wonderful permaculture person who's coming down Cindy March 5th for three days to work with the land, <laughs> to work with us. On, on how to work with the living beings and the land that is living. So difficult to use the words right. Um, it, not right, but in a, in a, in a new way. Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here, but uh, loyalty is, is based on a sense of connection. And that's something that we need to really uh, actively develop within ourselves and we can I don't know how it is for the rest of you I know that each year for me as I get older uh, it feels like I'm connecting more and more and more and it's such a joyous thing I actually can't believe I said this but I said this to someone the other day I'm enjoying the aging process <laughs> because I'm I'm learning so much and seeing so many different perspectives and have the, having the, the weight of all the experience of the years. But the most fundamental thing that's changing for me is that I'm feeling more and more deeply connected. And it gives me strength and it gives me energy and it gives me hope. And it's a place from which to operate for me. So I share that in case it's of use to any of you. So Susan, in what ways do you feel more connected? Can you give me an example? Is it's, it because you think more about it? Is it because... Um, thinking about it is how I'm getting there. You're saying what? Which, one, which question yeah. do you want me to... Either one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, 
it's difficult to put those things into words because they're feelings more than uh, we don't have words for them. Um, and you know, some of the incredible books that are coming out, starting from what books that most of us probably know, like The Soul of the Octopus or The Hidden Life of Trees or uh, What a Fish Knows or um, Speak for the Trees, which we just mm -hmm. talked about last time. Um, so maybe it's not so much, sadly, that I'm getting wiser and older. <laughs> it's more that this is happening as a group. Mm -hmm. So many of us are starting to get more aware. But I don't feel the same way about trees as I used to. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just, um, maybe it's a little bit something you said earlier, Cindy. Um, we, it's like beginning to, if you start to ask why, and, and you don't, if you start to ask why, things open. If you start even the slightest crack that there could be the possibility of a relationship with a tree, that's the beginning. And then it grows and it grows and it grows from there. So it's like if we keep opening little openings for each other or for ourselves, it, I think it comes naturally because the connection is there and we're not open to it. But if the, once there's the slightest little glimmer of light that is possible, I think we run with it because we sense it. Mm -hmm. We sense the, con the natural connection. One of my favorite lines is um, when you connect with something, there's an energy that flows between you and whatever the other thing is, be it a tree, a human, whatever, and there's, there's, a, there's a live fertilization that takes place. And we instinctively love it when we sense it. But most of the time we're, we're kind of shut down or oblivious because of all the tremendous amounts of pressures, childhood stuff and all the rest of it. And our job is to help one another not be oblivious. And from there, the loyalty comes naturally and the action comes naturally, whatever it is. I don't know if that's answering your question or not. Susan, a question. Um, have you found that you trust uh, more easily uh, as you get older? As I'm getting older, I'm uh, part of a, a peer group. I have uh, a number of different uh, neighborhood organizations. If I have this house that I do share, it's a big house in New York and uh, right in Manhattan. But then in Eagle, Idaho, uh, there's a community, and this might be helpful for somebody, online community called Nextdoor. Uh, and I didn't know any of my neighbors until I joined this thing next door and everything's being offered for free. People are finding each other's animals. People are uh, helping each other out. Um, and uh, it just opens you up to this authentic trust within a group uh, that you didn't know at all. Uh, and uh, less, go I'm not very guarded anyway, but it, <laughs> less guarded, uh, it seems to me. Uh, as I'm getting older, instead of the other way around. I'm definitely less guarded, mm -hmm. if that's an answer to your question, much mm -hmm. less guarded. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter as much. Mm. What matters more is the openness and the beautiful things that happen when you're more open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also think, this is Katie again, um, I also think for me, I agree with you wholeheartedly about this being such an incredible time of life. Um, and uh, I feel like I can reinvent myself and I walk every day. I walk out in, uh, uh, along the river here and there's beautiful cottonwood trees. Anne, I loved your story about the cottonwoods. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was just so powerful because I connected with it uh, tremendously. There's a beautiful circle of cottonwoods where I walk. And um, there's, there's um, sweet grass and there's just, you know, and I just find myself listening and connecting. And it just is such an incredible opportunity to, um, 
really recreate my own self and my own relationship with um, whatever it is in nature. It might be a rock, it might be a stick, it might be whatever it is. Um, I feel like there's an interaction now that I never ever felt before. Mm -hmm. And it is very beautiful and very moving. And I do it every day, it's kind of addicting. <laughs> so I agree with you about the aging process and, and uh, how it really can lead to more beautiful things. Answers, thank you. You can mute me and speak in. Yeah. <laughs> and in the lower left is our high tech person. <laughs> and we're in the same room. So if I speak and she speaks, it'll, but she can shut me up and speak. <laughs> If you don't want to do that, and saying thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and rounding it back, because we started with things that were of significant ugliness, like, like cars and plastics and all. And I said, it's not necessarily a negative conversation, because really, when we come from the place that we've, we're just talking about now, then it's obvious that we need to do something about it. And it's coming from a place of beauty and strength and love. And then the, it, it's not this, this hard or horrible um, actions we have to take, it just comes naturally. Whatever it is that we decide to work on. And if each of us does that, a lot will get done. It feels like there's such an ability to influence people in a positive way, uh, my, with my own children, with their friends, uh, with uh, and, 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 and that gentleness that comes uh, with listening uh, and uh, um, just being super calm about things that are causing friction. Uh, and um, so where your lo my loyalties lie, it's such a great question. Uh, they, it feels like uh, it lies, it's everywhere, my loyalty. Mm -hmm. to, uh, to try to do the best I can uh, and offer anything I can. And as I get older, I have more wisdom to offer. If someone is asking me, and I also just come, you know, to the party, so to speak, uh, with uh, this sense of um, connection. And then that kind of spreads, but that's the vibrational thing you were talking about, it feels to me. It works. <laughs> it really does. You enter the room, you enter the room, and everybody, anybody who actually knows you, or if you enter the screen, <laughs> people can feel it. So, yeah. It works, and it's a joy. But knowing you a bit, Jan, I think your loyalties are everywhere. I think your loyalties are to life. I think, I suspect that's true of everybody here. In all its forms. And kindness. You know, the kindness that's and lacking, you know, sometimes around every, what's in every, the rush. Uh, uh, there's, um, this is a really wonderful, uh, it's the first time I'm actually participating in this and uh, and it feels healing and i think a lot of us need that healing oh yes <laughs> we need it urgently we're bombarded constantly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have a few minutes left for those of you who haven't spoken up we would love to hear you anything you have to say I'm not monitoring the chat, so I don't know if then people are unable to, like, like Katie was a while ago. Nobody's having problems. Okay. I have one thing I'd like to share. I don't want to take up space from the others, um, but uh, so. Um, this cycles back to our loyalties and new thinking. And 
we've we've talked before about how the same mentality, you know, in our culture, what's considered masculine and what's considered feminine. Um, you know, we're we're really in need of more nurturing, you no know, more um, um, creative, inclusive types of approaches that are labeled feminine. And uh, I found myself a couple of days ago just being incredibly irritated. Um, and I'm starting to learn that when I feel irritated, there's something that I need to recognize about myself, not about what I'm irritated about. And uh, I was just, I was just so irritated about how devalued, you know, food, I'm making food for my family or something and they don't really care. They just expect it to be on the table at that moment of that sort of thing, that these feminine activities of making food and growing food, preparing food, cleaning up, nurturing our environments, you know, the whole envir environmental problems um, have fallen to women to figure out in many ways. And I realized after I, after I was with it for a while, it was like, wait a minute, how do I devalue food preparation? How am I devaluing my contribution uh, through nurturance? How, how do I devalue mothering? Mm -hmm. and, once, and to own that was really potent because I'm still, you know, I carry the cultural narrative. We don't get paid for any of those things, so they're not of value. And as long as I believe that, then we can, how, how can I move forward to be part of reconnecting, of being part of nature, of being part of the healing, the mutual healing process, of being part of the mutual nurturance process? And so to reframe it of, I value that. In fact, it's the most valuable thing. Yeah. That's in the line of life and money isn't. Exactly. Being paid isn't. Right. So Betty, I felt like I left you hanging a bit when you asked, how do I handle it? When I moved up here, I wasn't familiar with large amounts of snow. And the first year we got um, there were huge blizzards and we couldn't get out for three days, which is a bit inconvenient. One of our cougars was almost blown, filled in this entire area, which was on the corner because we weren't prepared for it. We went out and there's this little hole for him to breathe through. It was that, that bad. Obviously we got him out quickly. Um, but since then what I did was uh, actually celebrate it and adapt to it so you have enough stores in that if there you don't have to get out and you have skis so that if you have to get somewhere you can use skis um, and then you begin to celebrate and enjoy it but it is a process of adaptation particularly if there's change and if the area where you live doesn't have s snow and now it does and it's always inconvenient, but it's also just really interesting to learn to adapt to the changing. It's just my, I didn't want to leave you hanging there. I think, does anyone have any, it's, it's seven o'clock, does anyone have any final thoughts I'd like to share before we end the conversation and meet again next week, next month? We'll send out everything to you. Anne will send, that's Anne who we got to see now. High tech Anne. <laughs> um, she'll send out. Uh, so I think the references we had were the Buy Nothing and the Next Door that Jan had, which sounds great. And the Five Wise is actually a philosophy. The what is Anne? The Five Wise is a philosophy that I'll, I'll send. Okay. Out. Okay. The Five Wise. Um, and any final? words from anyone other than thank you very much for coming everybody so we'll send out the next date of the conversation will be a month from now and good night
Conservation Conversations are a production of the Earth Fire Institute, a wildlife sanctuary and rehabilitation center whose mission is to change how people see and therefore treat wildlife and nature. Join us as we work toward becoming a committed and supportive community of all beings. Earth Fire depends on your donations to continue these conversations. You can donate at our website, www.earthfireinstitute.org. The soundscapes are by Wild Sanctuary Presents, Bernie Krauss and Philip Arberg. Thank you for listening. Please join us for these monthly conversations. <laughs>